First of all, I would like to say welcome to our ministers. Minister of Agricultural, Food and Forestry, Turkey, Mr. Bekir Pakdemirli, and Minister of Agriculture, Food and Forestry, Mr. Rumen Parodzanov, welcome to our summit. Evet, esteemed guests, next will be the panel titled The Role of Agriculture in S Sustainable Development and Cooperation. I would like to invite Mr. Rumen Parodzanov, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Forestry, Bulgaria, please, stage is yours. Your Excellency, Minister Pakdemirli, honorable guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, allow me first to congratulate the organizers for the, this great initiative and to express my gratitude to the host for the kind invitation for excellent and excellent organization. It's my honor to be keynote speaker today, together with my colleague, Minister Pakdemirli. In the modern world, the key for achieving a better future is cooperation for sustainable development and peace. For that reason, I think that the opportunity provided by International Cooperation Platform to discuss a number of issues between the leaders and the decision makers is a great importance. Turkey is a good example of a strong and developed agricultural economy which is among the top 10 in the world and is an important partner of Bulgaria for developing stable cooperation in the field of agriculture. Regular bilateral meetings, signature of number of bilateral documents in the field of agriculture, and the Turkish-Bulgarian Agribusiness Forum held in Sofia last November are only part of the initiatives that help deepening our cooperation and implementing concrete practical steps ahead. Agriculture has a specific role in the socio-economic life in Bulgaria. Traditions in production of cereals, vegetables, fruits, and animal husbandry are key factors in its development. Bulgaria has a number of competitive advantages for investment in these areas. Today, nearly 12 years after Bulgarians European Union accession, the overall product productivity in Bulgarian agriculture has developed to extent it's comparable with the average for the Union. The agricultural sector provides employment for about 7% of employed in the all economic sectors and creates about 5% of Bulgaria's gross value added. Agricultural activities will remain an important source of income for a large part of the population in the country. Bulgaria has exceptionally strong grain sector and well-developed fruit and vegetable production. Our wines are of high quality and are competitive on the world market. Bulgaria is an established producer of high quality processed fruits and vegetables, as well as of honey and bee products. We have long-standing traditions in, in the production of rose and lavender and lavender oils. And because of their exceptional qualities, they are preferred by the world's industries. This ranks our country at one of the first place in the world of production and export. For several years, for several years the Bulgarian food and beverage industry has undergone restructuring, consolidation, and modernization. Our processors have actively invested in new technologies, know-how, and marketing. Almost a decade later, their investments are now fully or largely paid off. In this way, companies today can more freely plan their development and improve their market positions. Special emphasis should be put 
on the quality and safety of Bulgarian agricultural products and foodstuffs that are guaranteed. Bulgaria, has a number of the, as a member of the European Union, applies very strictly the European policy in this area, including food control and traceability throughout the chain. For years, the agrarian sector is only one of one that has formed a positive foreign trade balance. This defines as a viable industry capable of contributing to the acceleration of economic growth. It helps realize significant social and economic goals. Trade and export of agricultural goods increase annually, according for about 13 and 50 percent respectively of the total of the country. The main exported agricultural products in value terms are cereals and oil seeds, wheat, maize, barley, sunflower, rape, tobacco and cigarettes, bakery and pastry, meat, especially uh, poultry, cheese, chocolate, and others. During the recent years, there has been an intensive penetration of new technologies in, the, in all spheres of the economy and public life. The agrarian sector cannot lag behind these processes, given its strategic importance for ensuring the country's food security. My ministry promotes the digitization process of the agriculture in its entirety. This is why I'm happy to be here with Mrs. Svetlana Bujanova, chairperson of the Institute of Agro Strategies and Innovations, to whom I have entrusted the preparation of the strategy for digitizing, digitizing the Bulgarian agriculture. This strategy will give green light for building the necessary infrastructure for the digital transformation of agriculture and provide the specific measures for this transformation. The accelerated development of digital technologies and the establishment of the new business models in agriculture can contribute to attracting younger generation, thus slowing down the negative demographic processes and the population of rural areas. The European Union and Bulgaria as a member state both see sustainable development as priority. The European Union has a solid foundation in terms of supporting farmers, farmers incomes and sustainable development. It plays a leading role in the implementation of the United Nations program by 2030 by including sustainable development objectives in the European Union policies and initiatives. The common agricultural policy is a link between expectations of the European Union citizens about agriculture and the needs of European farmers, which are facing a number of economic and environmental challenges. This policy is an investment of the European Union in sector that is strategic in terms of food safety and food security, environmental protection and economic growth in rural areas. Worldwide, agriculture is an important source of income and the largest business in the world. One third of the economic, economically, uh, economically act active population lives off this sector. The world's average share of agriculture is about 4% of GDP. Our main goal should be overcoming the challenges, acceptance of differences, solidarity, merging of interests for a more peaceful world and cooperation between equal actors with common interests and mutual tolerance. I'm convinced that the discussions at the ninth Istanbul summit will contribute to, to further significant steps in the development of cooperation and sustainability. The Bulgarian government supports and encourages all initiatives that are in the interest of deepening and intensifying mutually beneficial cooperation. Therefore, I believe that within this initiative, we will be able to extract the best of our national specificities and bring them to a global level and more peaceful, better, and more sustainable future. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much. We would like to present the honor award for you. We would like to present the honor award for you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and I would like to invite to present the honor award former Minister of European Union Affairs, Mr. Egeman Bosch. Please. Thank you. And I would like to invite His Excellency, Minister of Agriculture and Forestry of Turkey, Mr. Bekir Pakdemirli, to the lectern to make his speech. Evet, saygıdeğer başkan, sayın bakanlar, uluslararası kuruluşların seçkin temsilcileri, iş dünyasının kıymetli mensupları, değerli misafirler, hanım, hanımefendiler, beyefendiler, ben de hepinizi sevgi ve saygıyla selamlıyorum. Size buradan gelmeden önce Cumhurbaşkanımızla görüştüm, onu da selamını iletmek isterim. Sizleri bu güzel şehrimizde misafir etmekten onur, onur duyuyorum. Barışın sürdürülebilmesi herkes için kalkınma ve bu oturumda sürdürülebilir kalkınma ve tarımın buradaki işbirliğini konuşacağız. Değişen dünyada nasıl rol kapacağız? Bu çok önemli. Ülkeler nasıl rol kapıyor? Bunlar hakikaten çok önemli. Mesela Almanya otomotiv ve beyaz eşyada ön plana çıkmış durumda. Çin aşağı yukarı her ürünü üretebiliyor. Kore elektronik ve otomotivde ön plana çıktı. Hollanda tarımda dünyanın ikincisi. Amerika dünyada bir öncü rol hala oynuyor. Nasıl bir dünyada yaşıyoruz? Değişen küresel dengelerin olduğu bir dünya. Kısalan mesafelerin, artan iletişimin, dünyanın global bir köy olduğu, nesnelerin, internetinin, akıllı telefonların, tabletlerin olduğu bir dünyadayız. Elektrikli ve uçan arabaları konuşuyoruz artık. Uzay madenciliğini konuşuyoruz. Uzaya yapılacak seyahatleri konuşuyoruz. Peki dünyamız nereye doğru gidiyor? Nüfus artışı var. Kentleşme çok artıyor. Sanayileşme bir yandan çok artıyor ve köyden kente bir göçümüz var. Bunun yanında çölleşme var ve iklim değişikliği var ve ihtiyaçlarımız artıyor. 2050 yılı itibariyle Dünya nüfusunun 10 milyar olacağını varsayıyoruz. Kentleşmenin %70'lere varacağını, gıda üretiminde en azından %60 arttırma mecburiyetimiz olduğunu biliyoruz. 1 milyar insanımız aşırı, aşırı yoksul, 800 milyonumuz aç ama bir taraftan da 600 milyon insan bir şekilde obez. Her yıl 1.4 milyar ton gıda israfımız var. Yani dünyada üretilen her üç gıda maddesinden bir tanesi her yıl atılıyor. Ve atıldığı durumda da bunun aslında %50'si, 40 ila 50'si yenilebilir durumda. Morgan Freeman'a göre insanlık Afri Afrikalı bir anne çocuğuna tabağındaki yemek bitecek diye bağırdığında insanlık kurtulacak diyor. Bizim inancımızda da komşusu açken tok yatan bizden değildir diye bir inancımız var. Bugün itibariyle 39 ülkenin gıda, 80 ülkenin su sıkıntısı var. Ve bunların da ileride su savaşları ve gıda savaşlarına yol, yol açabileceğini düşünüyoruz. Küresel ısınma %20 ila 40 bir verim düşüne neden olacak. Ve küresel ölç ölçekteki ikili alanlar, meralar ve ormanlar karasal alanlarında %60'ını teşkil ediyor. Bu alanlarda tatlı suyun yüzde yetmişini kullanıyor ve mevcut sanayi uygulamalarıyla da 2050 gıda talebine eğer karşılaştıracak olursak yüzde 65 daha fazla suya ihtiyacımız var, yüzde 67 daha fazla tarımsal araziye ihtiyacımız var, yüzde 87 daha fazla sera gazımız olacak. 
Tarım arazilerimiz yok oluyor. Su ve toprak kaynakları dünya çapında kirleniyor. Peki nasıl bir Türkiye'de yaşıyoruz? 2050'lere geldiğimiz zaman 100 milyon civarında bir nüfus olacak. Kentleşmenin %86 olduğu bir Türkiye, küresel ısınma, yanlış gübreleme, erozyon gibi sebeplerle de tarıma elverişli arazilerin azaldığı bir Türkiye'yi mutlaka görüyor olacağız. Tabii ki iyi haberler de var. Erozyonla mücadelede Türkiye dünya lideri. 1970'lerde senelik Türkiye'nin erozyonla toprak kaybı 500 milyon ton bölü yılken, şimdi 2017'de 154 milyon ton bölü yıla düşmüş. Ve 2023 hedefimizde 130 milyon ton bölü yıl. Dünyada orman varlığını arttıran nadir ülkelerden biriyiz. 2023 hedefimiz 15 yıl içerisinde %30 orman varlığımızı arttırmak. Şu an 4,5 milyar üzerinde fidan diktik ama 2023 yılında 7 milyar fidan dikmiş olmayı hedefliyoruz. Tabii bu saydığım her şey tarımla ilgili, gıda ile ilgili zor bir ev ödevini getiriyor. Ve ben aşağı yukarı her konuşmamda bunu söylüyorum. Tarım savunma sanayinden daha önemli diyorum. Çünkü gerçekten her türlü teknolojiyi yapabilirsiniz ama halkınız açsa, eğer buzdolapları boş, boşsa e, bunun bir anlamı yok. O yüzden tarım savunma sanayinden daha önemlidir diyorum. Çünkü Maslow'un da işte ihtiyaçlar hiyerarşisine baktığınız zaman önce karnımızı doyuracağız. Karnımızı doyuracağız ki ondan sonra diğer ihtiyaçlar ön plana çıkacak. Türkiye'nin bugünkü durumuna da kısa bir göz atacak olursak aslında Türkiye e, tarımda başarılı bir ülke. Nasıl başarılı? Avrupa Birliği'nde tarımsal hasılada Türkiye birinci, dünyada yedinci ama özetle baktığınızda toprak varlığında da on yedinci. Yani bu çok ufak bir matematik bize şunu veriyor. Biz Türkiye'deki sınırlı kaynaklarımızı aslında iyi kullanıyoruz. Avrupa'da birinciyiz, dünyada yedinciyiz. On yedinci olmamıza rağmen kaynaklar açısından. Biyoçeşitliğimiz iyi, tarımsal üretimde yeterli varlığa sahibiz. Küçük aile işletmeciliğimiz hala var. Ve bunun da devamından yanayız. Dış pazarlara yakınız. Türkiye'nin yakın olduğu pazarların toplamı 21 trilyon dolar. Dış pazarlara yakınız. Tarıma dayalı ve bağımlı bir sanayimiz var. Geneksel üretim kültürümüzü hala devam ettiriyoruz. Ve belirli ürünlerde de dünya lideriyiz. Mesela fındık, mesela kiraz, incir, kayısı gibi ürünlerde de dünya lideriyiz. Yakın zamanda Davos toplantılarına katılmıştım. Orada şunu söylediler. Dünyada henüz olmayan ama 2030'lu yılların ortasında olacak bir şirket var. Bu şirketin ismi henüz belli değil, henüz kurulmamış ama dünyanın en zengin şirketi olması bekleniyor. Bu şirketin bir eğitim şirketi, uzaktan eğitim şirketi olması bekleniyor. İkinci şirketle ilgili, yani iki ile beşinci şirketler arasındaki e, şirketlerle ilgili de bir öngörü yaptılar. Bunun da bir tarım şirketi olacağını, bir gıda şirketi olacağını e, söylediler ve düşünüyorlar. Bana göre dünyanın, dünyayı doyuran da dünyanın lideri olacak. Tarımı olmayan ülke de hakikaten mutfağı olmayan bir e, eve benziyor. Ama bunun yanında da toprağın ve tarımın da siyasetini yapmadan dünyadaki tüm ülkeler bir araya gelerek bu zor ev ödevini nasıl yapacağız buna karar vermemiz gerekiyor. Geçenlerde Türkiye dünyanın en büyük yeni havalimanını açtı. Üçüncü havalimanı. Ee, Tabi burada biz Türkiye gerçekten icraat yapıyor. Lafla değil Türkiye 29 Ekim'de Cumhuriyet'in kuruluşunun yıl dönümünü icraatla kutladı. Dünyanın en büyük havalimanı. Şimdi onu bir kenara koyuyorum. Havalimanının bir tarafında düşünürken dedim ki Kazakistan'a kadar giden bir demir yolu bu havalimanı. Boğazlar, Kanal İstanbul, bizim etraftaki zenginlikten, dünyanın refahından daha fazla pay alıyor olmamız lazım. Hep söylenen bir şey var, dillere pelesenk olmuş bir şey vardır. Hollanda 40 bin kilometre kare, Konya 39 bin kilometre kare işte. Hollanda Konya kadar yerde her şeyi yapar eder. Aslında baktığınız zaman Hollanda'nın kendi tarımsal gayri safi milli hasılası 23 milyar dolar. Ama toplam satışları, tarımsal satışları da 100 milyar dolar. Bu demek ki Hollanda hub olmayı becermiş ve dünyanın her tarafından gelen tarım ürünlerini tekrar paketliyor, işliyor ve dünyaya satıyor. Yani bizim de özellikle bu bölgedeki 
zenginlikten, hububattan, Ukrayna'daki hububattan, Kazakistan'dan, Rusya'dan ve diğer ülkede Bulgaristan'dan bu ülkelerin zenginliklerinden, bu ülkelerin üretimlerinden çok daha bir bölgesel hub olarak faydalanmamız lazım diye düşünüyorum. Tabi sadece tarım ürünleriyle de olmuyor. Yani mutlaka markalaşma ve bir şeyler de koymak lazım. Türkiye'nin çok önemli global markaları var. İşte Türkseli var, Türk Hava Yolları var. Birçok global markası var ama bu global markaların yanına bir tane global gıda markası eklemek lazım. Özel sektörün evet senelerce çırpındı ve bugün de global olarak sayabileceğimiz gıda markalarımız da var. Ama yeni bir gıda markasını özel sektöre yaratmak ve bununla ilgili gerekli iletişimleri yapmak ve gerekli yatırımları yapmak bu saatten sonra belki özel sektörün işi olmamakla beraber biz bakanlık olarak bir çerçeve markası yaratıp bunun içerisinde işte Türk'ün lokumunu, kahvesini, kayısısını, fındığını ve fındığın işlenmiş ürünlerini, çikolatasını ve birçok ürünleri aslında paketleyebiliriz. Burada biz yapacağımız şey tabii ki bu ürünlerin hiçbirini üretmek değil ama bu ürünlerle ilgili çok önemli ve çok yüksek e, top quality bir e, şey çizerek kalite sistemi çizerek bu ürünlerin üretilmesini ve dış dünyaya pazarlanması. Çünkü bugün işte 1 liraya bir ürünü yurt dışına satmak mı çok daha iyi, 5 liraya işlenmiş olarak satmak mı çok daha iyi? Bunu hakikaten konuşuyor olmamız lazım. Yani tarımsal hasılanın ötesine bu işleri çıkartıp katma değerinden en son nihai anlamda da mutlaka faydalanmamız gerekiyor. Ya bu zeytinyağında da çok geçerli. İşte Türkiye zeytinyağında hakikaten dünyada ikinci ama zeytinyağını yeterince değerlendiriyor mu? İhracatın önemli bir kısmı hala e, dökme e, dediğimiz şekilde gerçekleşiyor ve İspanya ve İtalya Türkiye'nin bu konudaki en büyük e, müşterilerinden bir tanesi. Devlet aslında bununla ilgili yeterli çaba ve teşviği de koyuyor ortaya. Ambalajda büyük teşvikler var ama bizim burada biraz daha e, planlı gitmemiz lazım. Tabii tarımla ilgili hiç mi gelişim alanımız yok? Tabii ki e, mutlaka gelişim alanımız var. Gelişim alanlarından bir tanesi ürünleri bir şekilde optimize etmemiz lazım. Yani sınırlı bir kaynağımız var. Sadece buraya bir tarla gibi düşünceseniz, siz de bir işletmeci olsanız bu Türkiye'nin dikilebilir arazisini düşündüğünüz zaman buna eğer optimize edebilirseniz, optimize eden kaynak şu e, kasıt şu, eğer tamamen sürtünmesiz bir ortam, yani tamamen karı maksimize eden bir ortama doğru gidecek olsak, Türkiye aslında bugün tarımsal hasılasını dörde katlayabiliyor. Böyle bir test yaptık arkadaşlarla. Ama tabii ki Türkiye'nin de belli gereksinimleri var. Belli ürünlerde kendine, kendi kendine üretmesi konusunda hassasiyetleri var. Bunları da alt alta koyduğumuz zaman ama buna rağmen iyi bir optimizasyon ve iyi bir planlamayla Türkiye bugünkünden daha fazla ürün üretmesi söz konusu olabilir. Şöyle ki biz yüzde 20-25 daha fazla ürün bile üretebilsek önümüzdeki 20 yıllık ev ödevinde en azından yüzde 50-60 daha fazla gıdaya ihtiyacımız varsa bunun yüzde 20-25'ini optimizasyonla çözsek yüzde 30'unu da işte sulamalarla ve diğer kaynaklarla çözebilirsek ev ödevimizi tamamlamış oluruz diye düşünüyorum. Biraz daha fazla teknolojiyi de kullanmamız lazım, verimliliği de kullanmamız lazım. Göreve geldiğinde en büyük problemlerden bir tanesi çiftçinin girdiği kaynakları olan mazot. Mazot, mazot ve mazotla ilgili hep taleplerin ardı arkası kesilmiyor. Yani işte dünya bu kadar elektrikli araçları konuşurken neden elektrikli traktör olmasın dedim. Hemen büyük üreticileri de çağırdım. Bu elektrikli traktör konusunda aslında Türkiye'de de çok büyük bir sanayimiz olmasına rağmen traktörle ilgili çok da hazır olmadığımızı gördüm ama bu konuda şimdi prototip çalışmalarına başladık. Bunlara da devam ediyoruz. Aslında e, doğada cevabını aradığınız zaman her şeyin cevabını bulabiliyorsunuz. Amerika'da büyük işletmeciler, büyük tarla sahipleri asla mazota para vermezler. Mısır yetiştirirler. Mısır'dan etanol üretirler ve etanolle traktörlerini beslerler. Biz de günün birinde buralara doğru gelmemiz, sineğin daha çok yağını nasıl çıkartırız bunlara bakmamız lazım diye düşünüyorum. Destek ve yönlendirmelerimiz var. Aslında 7,5 kat arttırmışız. Son 15 yılda 2 milyar TL'den aşağı yukarı 15 milyar TL destek ve yönlendirmelerimizi getirmişiz. Ve bu an, burada bir göreceli başarılı var. Yani başarı var. Bitkisel üretimi işte aşağı yukarı %20 arttırabilmişiz birim olarak Türkiye'de. 
Hayvansal üretimde yüzde 60-70 arttırabilirmişiz. Ha bitkisel üretimde demek ki vermiş olduğumuz destekler belki daha etkili verilebilseydi daha fazla arttırabilirdik bu 7 kat arttırmayla ama destek ve yönlendirmelerin de etkilerini tekrar mutlaka ölçüyor olmamız lazım. Meteorolojiyi önemsiyorum ve hava tahmini için harcanan her bir doların da tarımda aşağı yukarı 15 dolarlık kazanç getirdiğini e, söylüyor. Bunu söyleyen biz değiliz, meteoroloji otoriteleri söylüyor. E, ben de zamanında tarımla ilgili bir firmaya yapmış olduğum danışmanlıkta e, bir, şöyle bir istek geldi. Mart ayındaki, önümüzdeki sene Mart ayındaki patates fiyatını bilmek istiyoruz. Ben de dedim ki bakalım. Ve Fransa'da bir istatistik modelleme firması bulduk. Onlar bir çalışma yaptılar. En son getirdikleri modelleme şuydu. Tamamen meteoroloji verisine dayanarak Temmuz'daki hava sıcaklığı, Eylül'deki yağış, Kasım'daki don, Mart ayındaki size fiyatı veriyor. Şimdi bunu hakikaten düşündüğün zaman, önünüze aldığınız zaman bu inanılmaz bir veri. Eğer medyacıysanız yarının manşetlerini biliyorsanız zengin oldunuz. Borsacıysanız yarınki hisse fiyatlarını biliyorsanız zengin oldunuz. Dövizle uğraşıyorsanız yarınki döviz kurunu biliyorsanız zengin oldunuz. Tarımla uğraşıyorsanız yarının e, tarımsal emtia fiyatlarını biliyorsanız doğru seçimler yapmanız konusunda çok önemli bir mesafe kat ettiniz demektir. Diğer bir gelişim alanımız da tabii Türkiye'de ölçek. Zamanda mirasla bölünen arazilerimizi biz bir şekilde, hızlı bir şekilde toplulaştırmayla tekrar bir araya getirme gayreti içerisindeyiz. Burada da ortalama arazi büyüklüğümüz aşağı yukarı 6 hektar. Ama Fransa'da 40 hektarın üzerinde, İngiltere'de 95 hektarın üzerinde. Arazi tabii ne kadar büyük olursa o kadar bir ekonomik üretim yapma imkanımız var. Bu konuda... Yani Türkiye çok önemli mesafeler kat etti. 8.2 milyon hektar alanda bir e, toplaştırmaya gittik. Bunun 3 milyonu tamamladık. 3 milyonda bitmek üzere. Kalanlar üzerinde de çalışıyoruz. Diğer taraftan tabii ki yani tohumdan çatala dediğimiz bir süreç var. Tohumdan çatala olan süreçte tabii ki e, Tarım Bakanlığı her e, noktasında bir şekilde sürece değmesi gerekiyor. Bu anlamda bizim tabii ki lisanslı depoculuğu mutlaka, yani şu anda teşvik vermekte olduğumuz lisanslı depoculuğu mutlaka daha fazla arttırmamız gerekiyor. Şu an tekrar hal yasası üzerinde çalışıyoruz ve artık ticaretin önemli bir kısmı modern kanal, zincir mağazalar üzerinden yürüdüğü için orada da perakende yasası üzerinde de çalışıyoruz ve özellikle işte herhangi bir e, şehrin, herhangi bir ilçesindeki, herhangi bir mahallesindeki e, vatandaşımız, çiftçi vatandaşımız arka tarlasında ürettiği ürünü eğer ön taraftaki zincir mağazalarda eğer satabilecekse e, bu, bunun çok önemli bir e, ek katkısı olacağını düşünüyoruz ve lojistik olarak bir katkısı olacağını da düşünüyoruz. Türkiye'de yani demokratik olarak güzel bir zenginliğimiz var. Birlikler ve kooperatifler 14 binin üzerinde varla. Ama tabii ki dünyadaki benchmarklara göre baktığımız zaman dünyanın ilk beşine, onuna, yirmisine, ellisine giren e, birliklerimiz ve kooperatiflerimiz yok. Bu konuda biraz daha çalışmamız lazım. Önümüzdeki günlerde bunlarla ilgili e, 3-4 tane peş peşe çalıştay yapacağız ve bu konuya da bir çağrı arıyor olacağız. Japonya bu konuyu çok güzel çözmüş. Aşağı yukarı 500 kadar kooperatifle 50 milyar doların üzerinde bir e, ciroya sahip bir kooperatif kurulmuş ve üreticiyle tüketiciyi bir araya getiriyor. İşte en güzel tarafı bu. Yani kooperatif veya birlik dediğiniz size mutlaka katma değer sağlıyor olması lazım. Aile işletmeleri mutlaka ayakta tutmamız lazım. Bu bizim için olduğu kadar diğer ülkeler için de Bulgaristan için de geçerli. Bunların sabit yatırım ihtiyaçları daha düşük, iş gücü maliyetleri daha düşük, iş bilen kalifi elemanları var. Patron işin başında zarar bile etse sahada kalmaya çalışıyor, mutlaka pes etmiyor. Diğer bir son 15 yılda önem verdiğimiz konu ise tohumdaki arz güvenliği. Tohumu dışarıdan ithal ettiğiniz zaman katma değer önemli ölçüde dışarıda kalıyor. Biz bu konuda 150 bin ton üretimden senelik 
1 milyon 50 bin tona geldik ve bu konuyla ilgili de yeterlilikler açısından da %30'lardan %80'lere kadar gelmiş durumdayız. E, ve 750 milyon dolarlık tohum piyasamızda da dünyada 11. sıraya geldik. Tohum üreticimiz sayı, sayısı da 15 yıl önce 152 iken bugün itibariyle 850'ye gelmiş ve bu konuda da çalışmaya e, ve devam ediyoruz. Sulama tabii ki olmazsa olmazı bu işlerin. Başarının da anahtarı biraz da sulamada. Eğer bugün tüm planladığımız sulama yatırımlarını bitirebilirsek üretimimiz %31 daha artıyor. %25 de diğer kanallardan yapsak gene 2050 ev ödevimizi yapmış olacağız. O yüzden sulama hakikaten başarımızın anahtarı. Biz burada bütçe içi kaynaklar kadar bütçe dışı kaynaklar konusunda da arayışlarımızı sürdürüyoruz ee, ve sulama ile ilgili agresif yatırım projelerimizin hepsini bitirmek istiyoruz. 2 milyon hektar daha sulanabilir alanı 2023'e kadar Türkiye'nin e, sulamayı açması gibi bir agresif hedefimiz var. Bunu da inşallah gerçekleştiriyor olacağız. Yeni bir şey, dünyada yeni konuşulan bir şeyden bahsedeceğim. Yeraltı barajları. Şimdi sulama ile ilgili baraj yaptığınız zaman o işin kamulaştırması var çevresel etki değerlendirmesi var. Birçok konu var. Ee, ve hakikaten işler de çok uzayabiliyor. Ama bir şekilde eğer yağmur sularını bir yerden besleyip yer altında biriktirip onu da bir şekilde çekmenin bir yolunu bulabiliyorsanız e, ufak bentler yaparak e, bu yeraltı barajlarının çok büyük katkısı var. Doğaya da tahribatı yok. Ve özellikle de barajı yaptığınızda barajda çok ciddi bir buharlaşma problemi oluyor. Ama burada bir buharlaşma problemi de olmuyor. Ve hiçbir şekilde doğaya da zarar vermemiş oluyorsunuz. Tüm bunları üst üste koyduğunuz zaman ve yapımı da çok daha ucuz. Çok daha az tahribatla, çok daha ucuza yapabiliyorsunuz. Bu konu dünyanın da üzerine Avustralya dahil olmak üzere birçok ülkenin de daha yeni yeni durmaya başladığı konu. Türkiye'de de az da olsa örnekleri olan bir konu. Bu konu üzerinde de çalışmaya devam ediyoruz. Sürdürülebilirlik için, madem ki sürdürülebilirlik konuşuyoruz, biz ne yaptık? Sudan'a gittik. Şimdi neden Sudan'a gittiniz diye özellikle bizim muhalefet partilerinden de bize yükleniyorlar. Ben de diyorum ki Sudan'a diğer ülkeler neden gidiyorsa biz de o sebeple gidiyoruz. Giden ülkeler kimler? İşte ABD 8.2 milyon hektar ya alan satın almış ya kiralamış. Afrika'da, Malezya 4.1 milyon hektar, Singapur 3.4 milyon hektar, Çin 3.1 milyon hektar, Brezilya 2.4 milyon hektar. Yani büyük ülkelerin hepsi mutlaka tarımla ilgili ev ödevlerine çalışırken sadece dönüp kendi sınırları içerisinde ben ne yapabilirim değil, ufka da dönüp ben bu sınırların dışında ne yapabilirim mutlaka bakıyorlar. O anlamda bizim de bu ev ödevimizde Sudan'da bize millet olarak en yakın milletlerden olduğu için Afrika'yı ya açılan kapı olarak biz de Sudan'ı seçtik. Türkiye'nin toplam ekilebilir alanının yüzde onu kadar bir alanı Sudan bize tahsis etti. Biz de önümüzdeki günlerde yerli Türk yatırımcılarımızla beraber burada üretim e, olanaklarını arıyor olacağız. Ben tabii ki Türkiye, başta Türkiye olmak üzere ama bölge ülkeleri de yani dünyanın refahından daha çok pay almamız gerekiyor diye düşünüyorum. Lojistik olarak hakikaten iyi bir bölgedeyiz. Küresel ısınma sadece ülkemizin e, sınırlarına tehdit etmiyor. Tüm dünyayı tehdit ediyor. Tüm bölge ülkelerini tehdit ediyor. Bizim bir şairimiz ve düşünürümüz var Yunus Emre. Diyor ki gelin tanış olalım ve işi kolay kılalım diyor. Ben de diyorum ki gelin geleceğimizi birlikte tasarlayalım. Ben... Boğaziçi Zirvesi'ne katıldığım için çok çok teşekkür ediyorum. Düzenle, düzenleyenlere de ayrıca teşekkür ediyorum. Çok sağ olun, var olun. Teşekkür ederim. Sayın Bakanım, size bir ödül takdimimiz olacak. I would like to invite Mr. Cengiz Özgenci to the lectern to present the honor award. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Esteemed guests, next will be the panel titled The Role of, the Role of Agriculture in Sust Sustainable Development and Cooperation. And our moderator is Mr. Erol Usar, the chairman of the Usar Holding Turkey. And our panelists are Mr. Hasan Abdelkader Hilal, Minister of Environment and Natural Resources and Urban Development, Sudan. Mr. Demir Sharman, the CEO of Anadolu Etap, Turkey. Ms. Svetlana Boyanova, Chairperson, Institute of Agro Strategies and Innovations, Bulgaria. Yes, stage is yours. Shall we get close? close yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's better. His Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as we have uh, two panelists, and only uh, we are two Turks, so uh, if you want, Mr. Sharman, let's continue in English as courtesy well, to the other guests and for foreign participants. So I would like to give the floor first to Mr. Demir Sharman, who is the CEO of uh, Anadolu Group. And uh, he is not only a person in charge uh, to talk for Anadolu Group in uh, agriculture. He is also will talk, I think, his experiences as the agriculture industry. Floor I'll, is yours. <coughs> I'll try my best. Thank you, Errol Bey. Honorable ministers, uh, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to, to join you at this, at this conference. Uh, it, has been, uh, it has been repeatedly said and mentioned that by year 2050, uh, the need for food will be 60% or 50%, uh, there are, we have different numbers, uh, will be more than what we have today. So that means we will, we will uh, need a drastically increased demand in 30 to 35 years uh, from, from, from now. That's, <clears throat> that's pr uh, probably undiscussable. Uh, however, more demand will not necessarily mean that you know, we will have more supply. Uh, for more supply, for more supply, we should, we should fight. For more supply, we should, we should work. It's uh, clear that in the near future, we will be facing both demand-driven and supply-driven challenges ahead. And it's not only in Turkey, it's all around the world. You know, I'm, I'm sure there is no doubt on this. And it's becoming clearer that each day we need to, we need to reform our food systems. That's the case in each, each and you know, every country. From climate change, uh, from water supply, from uh, supply of arable lands, transparency of our food, food choices. Uh, so there are many reasons why we need to transform our industries and our businesses from conventional systems to, to the uh, newly developed, newly discussed uh, sustainable, sustainable economies, sustainable growth economies. And that will be also the case in, in agriculture. Uh, sustainable development uh, was formally first put into writing in 1987 uh, by United Nations, by a commission of United Nations. It is World Commission on Environment and Development uh, as an agenda item to examine and guide 
the global environment and development. This was almost 30 years back. And it has gradually, the sustainable development, I mean, it has gradually moved from uh, being a political expression to actual real life studies and cases and business practices. And to be honest, uh, talking among, among friends, the, the concept, the terminology of sustainability has been overconsumed. The many organizations, businesses, you know, uh, to, to confess, the businesses, firms, companies use this as a, a PR, PR slogan or marketing slogan, the sustainability. So therefore, we had an erosion. We had an erosion in terms of sustainability. So having said this, still real and true Sustainable agriculture is still the best way. Bakanımızı uğurlayalım önce. Okay, we go on. Uh, despite all those, despite all those true and real sustainable agriculture practices are the best way to, to sustain the healthy future of the, uh, of the planet and the mankind. And also for the financial well-being of economic entities. There has been an increasing demand from a wide range of shareholder uh, groups uh, for enterprises to, to deliver not only economic performances but also socially, uh, socially and environmentally sustainable growth. So therefore, corporate social responsibility, business ethics and sustainable management have become important parts of each organization's strategy and their head to your their day to day operations in developing countries we still uh, mostly we, we still deal mostly with low cost production increasing supply with lower or constant cost base is still our focus there technology and the science is game changer in a world with aging population availability of labor is a, another critical issue for production while supply of labor is decreasing, uh, the robot, robots are, uh, are taught as substitutes. Besides, we are now well aware of uh, increasing technology on, on capable equipments and machinery in, in the food, food business and also in agriculture. And that superior performance compared to humans, they, they perform in a much competitive way, in a much better way. Mechanical harvesters, for instance, while operating, they are faster, they are cheaper, the cost effective, I mean, they cause less harvest loss. Or sprayers, they are working more diligently, more cost effectively. And with the very developed optical lenses, with the very developed optical lenses or attached computerized systems, I have seen with my own eyes wonderful examples of sprayers, agricultural sprayers. Artificial int uh, intelligence, Internet of Things, uh, agro-robotics, they will continue to penetrate into our lives more and more since we will need more efficiency on the production. We have also environmental perspective of the technology. Through digital farming and robotics, we give less harm to the nature, to the soil, to the air, because machines are ma making less mistakes. Uh, and if I also say a few words about the consumers, the educating, training the consumers, consumers in each country, that's quite, quite important for, for all of us, for the governments that's important, 
uh, for the companies, organizations, that's important, for universities, academy, that's important. Because, especially in developed markets, the consumers, consumers are the uh, rule makers. They have a huge buyer's power because based on the wealth of developed nations, the supply, they have more supply compared to the developing countries. So in, a, in an unlimited uh, market of you know, international supply, they have more options to, to choose. So therefore, educating them, training them uh, about the sustainability, about the future needs, about the preservation of the resources of the world. That's, that's quite, quite important. However, in developing countries, uh, people are less care about those because the, the, the urgency, the priority is the, the first the supply of the food. People are hungry or people are not as wealthy as they are in the West or in developed countries. Therefore, uh, in, in developing countries, the duty of governments, duty of regulatory agencies is much more critical than, than the developed ones. So therefore, we expect uh, more homework uh, from, from the governmental institutions or NGOs. I can tell you about some examples that we have been performing in, in, our, in our company, but just uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to also uh, use the time more efficiently, uh, but just three things. Uh, my, my, my, my company had won a couple of awards, many awards, uh, based on the sustainability efforts. Uh, because we focus on three pillars in, in, in this group. First, uh, we are the only company, the, sorry, we are the first company in Turkey uh, issuing sustainability, uh, agriculture, sustainable agricultural principles. That's we issued five years ago. Sustainable agriculture principles, that was our commitment to our, all our customers that you know, we would apply, we would work in line with those principles. Also, uh, we are very, one of the very few, just single digit, companies in Turkey who is having e e sustainability reports every year. And this is in accordance with GRE, GRI standards. And this is not only paperwork. Uh, we, we, ha uh, you know, we have a land of 3,000 hectares. We, we, we are uh, the largest fruit farmers of Turkey, and we are the largest fruit juice producers of Turkey. And here, Without any exception, at every centimeter of the land, we use drip irrigation uh, to, to use the water more, more efficiently. We have all those, the technology to fight against uh, spring frost and hails. Uh, we have sprinklers, uh, we have propellers, uh, you know, too much machinery. And we have mechanical harvesters, which we imported from uh, Europe and even even US. So we heavily use technology uh, for, for for sustainability and also for, for cost. And plus, you know, three pillars I said. First, sustainable agriculture. Number two, women. Empowerment of women. Purposefully, purposefully, uh, we employ more women as our workforce. Um, for six months long, we are rec we are hiring at minimum three thousand. Uh, workers in our farms and always 70% of that 3,000 is women, purposefully women. And we have the only, we are the only company who is operating creches, nursery, uh, the, the, the nursery schools in Turkey. So we are taking care of those kids, of the, those ladies who are working with us. And we, in, in these nursery schools, we are for four months' time, during the summertime, and schools are closed, we are taking care of 160 kids. We are training them uh, with, with Turkish, with painting, with music, uh, dances. Uh, so uh, they, they, have, they have really, in, in a, even the, the, the basketball school. We, we own a basketball club, as the Anadolu group, and we open the basketball school for those kids. I'm telling this not to make a PR or marketing of my own company, but really sincerely believing that uh, those can be really uh, good, inspiring points to, to other players of the, of the industry. And lastly, you know, 
I want to conclude my words just, you know, underlying once, once again that the collaboration, cooperation in the area of sustainability, sustainable agriculture is key for the future. That's not luxury. That's a must. And a single company cannot overcome this. A single country standalone cannot overcome that, that huge, big problems of, of, the, of the world. So the governments should cooperate. The companies within a country should cooperate. The companies you know, between the countries, you know, internationally, should cooperate, collaborate. The organizations, agencies, especially research agencies, they should cooperate on exchanging ideas, views, best practices, and also, and also exchanging or establishing, sorry, establishing international standards and regulations. That's, that's something that could be done by the governments, setting international standards, improving the international standards, because we are all complaining about the herbicides, pesticides, and residues, those making our people cancer. The cancer rates all, our, all, our, all around the world is increasing because just to overcome the supply of food, we know that it's, it has been heavily, the pesticides and her herbicides are being heavily used. Just one more, you know, back to my last paragraph, all just I, I, uh, I forgot to mention, we are the only company in Turkey who obtained residue safe certificate. Residue, you know, a, a university that's Ege University in Turkey, regularly they're perform, performing 600 analysis on the residues, herbicides, pesticides, and they are time to time they are issuing residue safe standards for our products. Uh, this is not for marketing, but this is just to, to set an example uh, to, to, to the industry. So I'll end up my words uh, with a uh, quotation, using, a, using a, a quotation from Henry Ford. He has been saying that, you know, coming together is beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is the success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sherman, using the time very efficient way. Now the floors, floor is for Mrs. Svetlana Boyanova, who is president of Agro Strategy and Innovation Institute of Bulgaria, which is known about DG Agri. Please. Thank you. Yes, um, Honorable Minister Porozanov, Honorable Minister Pagdemirli, I could say today is the second day of the forum, so dear friends, participants and guests, uh, for me it's really a great honor to be here in this uh, forum, which is under auspice of the Turkish uh, President of the Tur Republic of, the, of Turkey, uh, Mr. Recep Tayyip Erdogan, which uh, for me is a huge sign that uh, this panel especially is of big importance for all of us. I'm sure that um, no doubts here in the room, this is a very important sector for all the countries, which is, by the way, something which is combine us every day, eating the food. Congratulations of uh, what you did. I am very impressed about uh, your company, by the way. Uh, before, um, to, I want to start with a um, quote as you finish with one. <laughs> Uh, it is uh, of Sir Arthur Kate, who is a Scottish scientist, who said, the discovery of agriculture was the first big step toward a civilized life. It is sure that uh, the agriculture is uh, really a uh, foundation of every economy and every society, and it is connected, it is linked with our daily life, with environment, with food security, with demographic structure, uh, with uh, uh, our health, normally what we are eating, we are health or not, with our life, with our intention to live in peace. But uh, the farmers who are putting actually the food on our tables, they face uh, in front big challenges, 
economic, environmental, social, like uh, climate change, like loss of uh, biodiversity, drought, also high individual risk, and um, also the farmers uh, still don't have enough market position on agro supply uh, chain. Uh, and um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and other initiatives have set up already uh, the main goal, food security, but in very short, limited time. And as Mr. Porozhanov said, uh, our farmers should do more with less. To do that, they need innovations. They need to be innovative. And innovations, and in particular digital innovation, can do that. Actually, digital innovations already benefit our farmers, our agri-food business, uh, in order to upgrade its products, also to optimize its processes, and also to change the business models accordingly to the digital change, which is already in progress, and it is very fast, very, few, uh, very huge. The adoption of digital technologies for more productive, for more uh, sustainable agricultural system will contribute to the achievement of these United Nations goals and will bring a number of benefits for our farmers, like uh, increasing profitability, also increasing produ productivity, uh, with reduced environmental footprint, access to new markets uh, without uh, heavy infrastructure that we have now, etc. But enhanced to, for our farmers to adopt uh, ICT uh, solutions in their own uh, agricultural holdings and farms, we need relevant policy actions, relevant policy investments in this, not only in infrastructure, but also in human capital. This could be done only, according to us, with long-term national strategy. And this national strategy uh, should uh, establish the framework for all these uh, uh, uh, crucial things that we have to have in place. This is infrastructure like a broadband in rural areas, also uh, e-government services that we should provide for farmers to get easy access to give the application, let's say for subsidies or whatever they are doing from home, easily um, and even for, for uh, to do it uh, without uh, putting aside uh, her, uh, their agricultural activity during the day. Also, we need to improve digital skills of farmers. Cooperation, as you said, Demir, it's very important. Cooperation between ICT developers, farmers, science, governmental, regional authorities is very important in order to to, to have a success for introducing and use of digital technologies. That's why setting up of so-called digital innovation hubs, uh, I will talk later a, a bit for this, is very important uh, uh, part of this uh, strategy. <laughs> Not, uh, of course, uh, to put uh, at the end, these financial instruments that we need to uh, support and to encourage farmers to uh, use digital technologies Another issue which uh, we should focus is uh, data sharing, how we are using data coming from farmers uh, and uh, how we are reusing this data. Digital technologies have to work for farmers. And uh, as many farmers have access to this, better. This will be great use not only for farmers, but also for the state as data collecting and processing, which uh, can be done through digital instruments, is very important to keep peace among different stakeholders in different sectors and also for planning the policy decision. Actually, I know that Turkey already is a little bit advanced uh, because they have already put in place some uh, information systems for collecting data several, by the way, information system, which can be used very, uh, in very good way for planning and not only for control of the uh, farmers. 
In particular, digital technologies such as uh, smartphones, sensors, satellites, drones, uh, provide a range of uh, farming solutions such as remote uh, measurement of soil conditions, better water management, as you said, every single hectare in your farming is uh, irrigated by the preci precision irrigation systems, I guess. Uh, also, we can control and monitor livestock and uh, crop performance. Analyzing the data which is collecting is also very important. Farmers can, uh, can follow a disease or patterns, crop patterns very easily and they could take action to prevent this uh, uh, animal health, to keep animal health and welfare. Uh, they could plan, farmers, they could plan more effectively and easily using digital technologies. The Internet of Things, as you said, the artificial intelligence, robotics, big data, all these technologies uh, could lead and they already lead to, for unprecedented innovation in our sector. And uh, this also creates new business models for farmers. They should leave the conventional, the old one, old fashioned uh, way to do business in this sector because most of the time, this sector is a little bit underestimated because maybe not only not many people see the potential in this sector. As the minister Pak Demirli said, it is very important to make a forecast for the prices. As he said, I want to know next year how many I would produce, and I want to make my plan as a farmer for the price of my production because all the farmers they are not producing because this is very good to produce but also they want to make money and to have good profit of this activity by the way in the european union because you know uh, bulgaria as a part of european union we are under the common agricultural policy uh, legislation and regulation and they made a survey among all the eu citizens that agricultural activity is bringing uh, still not such higher income for farmers compared to other activities in the European Union. So we need to think about incomes, uh, security of our farmers as well. Another technology which I want to mention, yesterday some, uh, maybe some of uh, you uh, participated in the panel uh, for the, some technologies uh, and uh, the one is blockchain technology. I would like to stress the importance of this uh, technology also and the big potential in agricultural sector. Blockchain technology helps uh, the government also helps uh, the whole sector and agriculture for, for, as a whole to trace and to make transparent the process from the production, from the seed in the field, to the uh, product and food on our tables. And it is very um, useful technology also for farmers to make their uh, forecast, as I said, uh, uh, for their own production. The benefits from the use of digital technologies may include improved crop yields, animal performance, optimization of process inputs. You know maybe that our farmers have to pay a lot for inputs, fertilizers, um, water, everything, the seeds, they should pay a lot. So digital technologies can reduce these costs and could, uh, of course, increase the profitability. But to do that, our farmers need skills. And uh, that's why raising awareness at the regional level among the farmers is something which we should work a little bit more, I believe, because especially for small and medium farmers, uh, farmers uh, holdings, for them, digital technologies doesn't sound very profitable. So we have to convince them that using digital technologies is not only for the suppliers to sell some products for your holding, but also to increase your productivity. A step forward uh, to foster these uh, conditions for dynamic and innovative farming is so-called, I told you, digital innovation hubs for agriculture. What is digital innovation hubs? This is an initiative of the European Commission recently, for a few years ago, 2016, that they announced. It is one-stop shop for, for buying, let's say, in brackets, digital knowledge. 
for your particular farming. Digital innovation hubs could be digital, could be physical, and there farmers, science, ICT developers, competence centers, all these people are working together, cooperate together in order to cover farmers' needs, particular farmers, not in, in principle. That's why the role of cooperatives is very important because they should go in these digital innovation uh, hubs. And as Minister Pak Demili said, cooperation is very important uh, because without cooperation, I don't think uh, farmers can go and just take digital technologies. Maybe these digital technologies is not convenient for their farm. And um, in these dig uh, digital innovation hubs, farmers could make um, testing, uh, piloting, uh, doing in real farms, some uh, uh, checking of the digital products that ICT providers could help. For example, last week I was in a place in uh, Bulgaria for, uh, it is a farm for cows. They are now using software who is uh, helping the farmer to analyze the milk, per the percentage of the uh, fat in the milk, because otherwise the company who is buying this milk, if it is not the percent that they want, they will not buy. So it is very crucial for this farmer to know exactly the percent of fat in the milk. Also, the software is preventing for disease called, I don't know in English, maybe it is for cows uh, disease. Uh, this software is uh, early warning this farmer how to use uh, and what to do, how to treat, with what kind of medicine he should treat cows in order to avoid this uh, disease. Um, and um, last but surely not least, it was mentioned from the previous speakers. In fact, digital technologies cannot replace humans, but they could attract young people to agriculture. Because today, even our kids have two daughters, they are using from the morning tablets, smartphones, etc. So uh, I believe that uh, digital technologies could bring uh, more people in our sector. Of course, they should go to the pharmacy and check, but sometimes, really, believe me, it's very difficult to uh, go, uh, to wake up early and to go in the farm or for uh, cow, cows to see and uh, to check everything. With digital technologies, they can do it even from home and to be with kids, let's say, uh, that time. So I think uh, nothing could attract more than digital technologies, young people of our days today. And the light motif of uh, this forum today was sustaining peace and development for all. This light motif is recently in the focus of the institute that I'm leading uh, these years um, in Bulgaria. And uh, we not only promote uh, using of digital technologies, like we are innovative broker for, for farmers, not only for digital innovations, but also different innovations. We are contact person, people for European Innovation Partnership for Agricultural Sustainability and Productivity. But we know that our role is even bigger than that because using the technologies really can bring the peace among the farmers. And as, as it was said by the minister, if we are not enough uh, fitted, of course, peace is crucial to keep it. And uh, I want to finish with a quote as well to be more interesting. But this is a quote from Kemal Ataturk. And you see how right he was. 100 years ago, he said, an arm that fights with a sword gets tired. And soon as it puts the sword back in its shell, it is most probably doomed to get rusty and moldy. But an arm that uses a plow gets stronger each day and with more strength, it gets more land. Let's use the instruments of our time, such as digitization, such as digital technologies, to make this arm work easier and to be more productive. 
Let's make this arm feed, not fight. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Boyanova. I think we are just on time. I think this is the first panel of all summit that we are on time. <laughs> thank you very much for the participants. Thank you for I would like to thank uh, our Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, Mr. Pak Demirli, but I especially want to thank to Mr. Rumen Porozanov, the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry of Bulgaria, to dedicate his time during the panel to listen to the panelists. I would like to thank you, Mr. Sharma. We know your successes and we wish to more successes. And Ms. Mrs. Poyanova, we wish you that you have a dream. If you dream, you can reach your dream at the end. So I hope <laughs> that you will reach Digi Hubs in Europe, mostly in Bulgaria. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Esteemed speakers, we would like to present honor gifts for you. Thank you so much. Esteemed guests, next will be the decision named Landless Nation towards a new global citizenship status. Moderator is Mr. Alijan Alijan Ayanlar. Correspondent TRT World. Our next moderator is Mr. Alijan Ayanlar, Correspondent TRT World. Esteemed guests, next will be decision named Landless nation towards a new global citizenship status, and I would like to invite our moderator to the stage, Mr. Alijan Ayanlar, correspondent, TRT World. Salonda mı kendileri? Ali Can Bey, merhabalar. İyiyim, sağ olun, hoş geldiniz. Ben sizi yok deyince ama davet ettim. <gülüyor> Güzel davet ettiniz. Ortansınız herhalde değil mi? Hoş geldiniz. Ne var? Sayın dinleyicilerimiz bir şey anladı. Medya paneli var oraya geçebiliriz. Ee, şu an başlıyor. Değerli konuklarımız yan odada, yan salonumuzda medya paneli başlıyor. Oraya da geçebilirsiniz. Burayı zaten anons ettim. Değerli konuklarımız panelimiz başlamak üzere sizleri yerlerinize davet ediyoruz. Değerli konuklar, panelimiz başlamak üzere. Sizleri yerlerinize davet ediyoruz.
Değerli konuklar, yan salonumuzda da medya paneli başlamaktadır. Biz de panelimize başlamak üzereyiz. Sizleri yerlerinize davet ediyoruz. Esteemed guests, I would, like, I would like to announce that afternoon session and our new panel a, uh, is about to start. Our technology lab grant through LACMA a couple of years ago, and so I was talking to SpaceX, which is one of the um, organizations that works with them, and gotten some very interesting conversations about the future of the space suit. Yeah. So. Distinguished guests, next will be the session named Lentness Nation towards a new global citizenship status. Our moderator is Mr. Alican Ayanlar, correspondent TRT World. Our panelists are Cheryl Edison, CEO of Edison International USA, Mr. Jonathan Keats, conceptual artist, experimental philosopher USA, Mr. Özgür Bolat, education scientist author Turkey, Mr. Amal Dokan, director of Babson Global Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership, Saudi Arabia. And lecture is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our panel discussion, uh, Landless Nation towards a new global citizenship status. Uh, we've certainly heard some very interesting discussions as we come to the day, uh, to the end of day two here at the Bosphorus Summit. Uh, I know it's been a very long day, so I'm going to keep my introduction uh, not too long uh, because you certainly didn't come here to hear me speak, but you did come here, you did invest your time to actually come and listen to our esteemed panels. Uh, let's get started, but before we do, uh, I'd like to say we up here on the stage, we're not in a bubble. Um, I'd like to get the audience uh, involved as much as we can. So if you have any questions or comments to what uh, some of our moderate, uh, panelists uh, say, uh, signal me, uh, either by raising your hand, winking at me, whatever is suitable for you, and I'll try to find an appropriate way to, to squeeze you. And I don't want to wait until the end of the session to actually get into uh, the Q&A. So that being said, I just want to add on some of the titles as I'm introducing our panelists. Um, we're so much more than our titles. Uh, to my left, Cheryl Edison, in a nutshell, uh, she champions the goals of individuals who are building their lives while teetering on the edge of what's next. Is that correct? That's close enough, thank you. Um, her global go-to-market strategies have launched new realities through products and services across 47 industries in five continents, so it's uh, quite impressive. Uh, to the left, Jonathan Keats, uh, he's been called a poet of ideas by The New Yorker, a multimedia philosopher prophet by The Atlantic, uh, and I think he'd like to also call himself a writer, an artist, and an experimental philosopher. Uh, to the left of him, Özgür Bolat. Um, he has attended pretty much all the schools that I've dreamed of going, but was never smart enough of going. Um, and to sort of paraphrase a Turkish phrase, phrase uh, or saying, uh, he has as many talents as he has fingers. Özgür Bolat, he's a, education, a scientific education, uh, education scientist and author. And completing our panel, uh, Amal Dokan, she is an entrepreneur, or entrepreneurship is at her heart, who is passionate in designing experiences while guiding startups and corporations to innovation. And I can tell you that is one word that she likes a lot, innovation. So that being said, uh, let's get started. Now, one of today's biggest injustices is how we treat refugees. Because of war, because of poverty, because of climate change, 
there are more than 70 million refugees around the world, and that number is expected to significantly rise over the next decade. Most of these people have had to seek refuge in different countries, and at a very superficial level, that actually uh, gives two points. A is that these people aren't able to go back to their homeland, and B, they're not really considered citizens of their host countries. Now, obviously, this creates a myriad of problems. Uh, but on the other hand, I think because in the age that we live in, we are living in the wealthiest era of humanity. And because of technology and the age of digitalization, we have a unique opportunity to create some profound changes. And I think our discussion today is especially meaningful because it's happening here in Istanbul, Turkey. Turkey, as you all know, hosts uh, nearly 4 million refugees. That's the highest number of any country in the world. So what do we have for you over the next hour? Hopefully, we'll be identifying the problem, uh, exploring some very innovative ideas, uh, perhaps inspiring change uh, or providing inspiration for politicians. Uh, but we're also going to be looking in the mirror and analyzing ourselves, and when we mean by ourselves, our society, on how we can change some things and perhaps some social stigmas. All right, let's begin. Uh, I want to start off with a sort of a rapid fire round, if you don't mind. And since we're dealing about stateless people, refugees, Cheryl, we'll start off with you. What do you think is the biggest challenge for them? You're asking me, what's the biggest challenge for people without a state? Is that given? I guess I have to say having a state. Okay. You know, so for me, having no place to call your own or having no belonging other than a belonging to a non-state is kind of an existential dilemma. Jonathan? To me, it really is a matter of the relationship of these people to the world at large. The xenophobia, the tribalism that these people face makes for what would potentially otherwise be a matter of migration, makes it into a challenge at best and at worst a humanitarian crisis and we tend right now to be heading well beyond the worst as a result of the fact that people who are not able to be where they are from have the exacerbating circumstances of a world that by and large is hostile to them. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Ozger, um, you deal a lot with speaking on educational matters. Uh, the, fa the fact of the matter is that not every society is very comfortable in accepting um, others. And we're seeing very clear examples in the world today. Talk us about the psychology of sort of accepting uh, people from outside. I think because I want to tie this issue to what Jonathan was talking about in terms of xenophobia. Okay, and you said it's about the relationship, uh, those people's relationship to the world at large. I would say what what matters most is your relationship with yourself. So, for instance, there are Turkish people who migrate to Germany. They always dream about coming back. Why? So, because they don't feel grounded, they don't feel at home. So being, feeling grounded in life has a lot to do with how you see yourself at life. So it's all about, it's all about feeling secure for who you are. And from other perspective, as a country, if you do not feel secure with your identity, with yourself, then anything foreign will challenge my view of identity. So. If I feel grounded in my life, if I feel connected to myself, then it doesn't matter which country I go to, and I feel happy and I feel at home. I, I, I will adapt. And those countries who feel grounded and secure in their individuality or identity, then they will be accepting. So if we, if we deal with the, those psychological issues, I think uh, the problem will be solved uh, much easily. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Amal, before I come to you, I just want to ask Cheryl, uh, listening to what Ozger just said. So, 
each individual problem is, is uh, in of itself can be different rather than just having one common theme of people being without a state then. So what I just understood you to say is that you believe that everything reflects back to the individual and the individual's relationship with self and place. That's what you just said, yes? yes. And what I understood Jonathan to say is that each individual needs a relationship to society as a whole. Did I understand you, Jonathan? That is correct. Right. And I don't understand what you said. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. Let me just bring in Amal for a second. So you, you deal with a lot of, um, lot of groups who actually work with refugees. Yep. Um, in your work, what do you think have, have been the biggest challenges? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story just to, because no matter how I would put theories on it, nothing comes better than what comes out of their mouth. So a few months ago, we gathered, you know, as a group of diversified people, as I was invited to Tactagora, a very cool initiative to discuss problems of the world and see if those accomplished people would be able to come, sit together, and maybe come up with a few assumptions about what's happening and sit with these people. We were privileged to have some of the Syrian refugees in that session. They sat with us. And one of the very interesting things that a young lady in her 20s was saying, she said, I, today here in Turkey, I feel I have a home. And I'm very happy that someone has asked me, you know, what's your story? She said, that's the first time I was offered services. I was offered a lot of things, but I need to feel that I'm cared for by the system around me and by the society around me. And I said, what do you call home? So what makes a home home for you? She said, what my parents is. So I think every one of us has something to care about, whether it's your parents, whether it's your business, whether it's something that you love to do, and then you call it home. A lot of people who migrate and go to other countries, they say, this is my home, right? My second home or my third home. So inclusion was one of the things that they really look at. We always believe in empathy and looking at these people and where they come from. We want to feel that we're offered what everybody's offered. We're not giving the different. Different is not good for them. Called a refugee is not something that they want, you know. I'm a citizen, I have education, or don't, but I can offer things to the society just like anyone else. So I think that was kind of, this is what we call sometimes the aha, you know, moment that we look for. And that goes back to what you're saying. It's what I feel inside first, and then how can the world or the society reflect back to me so I can live and I can have education and I can have access to healthcare and I can prep part, basically practice my business and they were actually entrepreneurs. So that's part of, yeah. Uh, for instance, if I go to your house, I can tell whether you are living your life or you, you are surviving in life. I can tell. Survival and living are two different things. Yeah. So if I migrate, if I'm a refugee, I can live in that country or I can just survive. So we don't want survival, we want living, full living. So it depends on the person and it depends on the society, like welcoming society, how they, how they perceive others. So it's also about their perspective as well. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm, you have told us to jump in, so I'm gonna jump. Go for it. So here, here's basically what I, I think we have an opportunity here now, right? One is the emotional question of whether we experience ourselves to be at the base of Maslow's hierarchy, survival, or whether at the next level, which is like, you know, employment, or whether we're at belonging, or whether we're at inspiration, right? Whether we're at creativity. We could discuss this for many hours and not get to the practical issue that many refugees face, as many people in third world countries face, which is at the bottom rung. Right? We're talking about this ability to engage in commerce. They cannot engage in commerce because they have no identification. This is actually the issue. Yeah. The, the rest is like, okay, let's talk about it. It's kind of existential. And I, I, maybe I sound a little impatient, but I feel impatient because I'm sure that wherever they're sitting, they feel darn impatient. You know, it's, it's not... If they cannot take control, if they cannot make things happen, but just to sit, you know, like a, like a monk at the top of a mountain to be happy, nothing's going to happen for their families or themselves. And this is to link to 
commerce, to make things happen for themselves. I just want to pause because I think Jonathan has something to say. Well, just to say that it is, if, commerce is a part of a larger ability to, to, to, to survive, to cope. I think that, that it actually is, even more fundamentally, in many cases, a matter of your boat is turned away from the shore. Uh, you have basically survival at the level that a biologist might understand it. That is to say, people are dying. So that also is a part of it. And so this question of how do you establish a basic means of enfranchisement is absolutely essential, which is not to say that self-actualization and everything else should be set aside and that these people should be treated as specimens, but it is to say that there are some deep problems that are systemic in addition to problems that are psychological or internal to the state of mind of an individual. So Cheryl, I mean, you've, you've talked about the importance of, of commerce, so how do you achieve that? I mean, is it, um, from what I understand, is there is a, gr a gross inequality at play here. H how do you address that then? Uh, so, you know, basically in any place in the world, if you want to do business, you have to actually be numbered. You have to have some kind of a number, whether it's a social security number, an employer's identification number, a tax identification number of some sort is typically required if you want to build anything other than a cash exchange. So that's a limiting factor. Somebody can have a cottage industry, somebody can have a kind of a subsistence if they do a cash exchange or a barter exchange, goods for goods, but there's no way actually to get up above that level and start doing international exchange unless you are identified. And so that's kind of where, as we like to say in Silicon Valley, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the reality of whether or not you exist commercially begins. That was good. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, for instance, le refugees are not allowed to participate in commerce, right? So what is the mindset of the policymakers that doesn't allow them to do that? Are you asking me? Yeah, yeah. So what mindset? What are the psychological fears or like why are they not letting them to do well, that? It, it, I think basically uh, my question too is if, if they if it's as simple as that number them why why haven't governments done that? Why haven't yeah. states done that? So I think that why is one of those so here's the, here's the thing with why. Why can be asked many many times. You can notice that particularly Little children ask why a lot, but it makes people crazy. Ever see a mother kind of go nuts because her kid's going, why, why, why? That why is not really the answer we want to address. What we want to address is what do we need to do in order to empower those people? What can we do? Not why don't they? Because actually the why has endless answers. Um. Endless, endless answers. Because there are, let's say it this way. There are uh, political forces that cause there to be nonsensical response. <laughs> nonsensical means you could keep going over and over trying to answer the question. There won't be a real why answer. But starting with why is about identifying some of the issues at least. So you're promoting, for example, for the commerce and the access for transactions. That's one element, right? And there's the element, the element of them and their well-being and all of that. And the problems with the systems and the government systems, one of the issues, it's, it's built based on what's known for them, based on old structures, right? So it hasn't really been adapted to what's happening today. Today, we might be facing new problems. Next year, we'll be facing other problems, more refugees, more crisis in the world, more environmental issues, and there will be more and more. And they're not moving as fast as we want them to be, right? Can we fix them? We can't really do that in a blink of an eye, and we wish that we could. But I think there's many issues that we can start with, right, and probably start addressing. We're all addressing different issues, but 
we're trying at certain ways. It's just not together. Well, and the reason that we see global citizenship is all around the world. A lot of people are thinking of that, right? But well, no one no, has came up with something. So, wait, hang on a second. I, I don't agree with three of your four rights. Mm. So in, when you were speaking, you said right four, four times. Three I don't agree with. Mm. The first one is I think it could be something as simple as governments like, okay, let's just start with Turkey because we happen to be here. How the heck is the government of Turkey supposed to hand out four million documents plus the 300,000 new baby documents? How, do you, maybe it's something as simple as they don't have a system. No, they do have a system. Well, but maybe they don't have a system because it could be your judgment that they have a system but maybe in like practical application, they can't. So one of the things that I've really noticed is that, you know what, like problems look a lot easier to solve from the outside. Like I can solve your problem a lot easier than I can solve my own. It's sort of kind of the way problems are. So I'm gonna just suggest that it does not help a problem by belittling how, I'm not saying you're belittling, but it does not help a problem to make it easy for that person to do what they're not doing. Because they, it's pretty likely there are some practical challenges. To address quickly the question though of why, why ask why, I think that it is a matter of understanding motivations. And in order to be able to work either with those motivations in a sort of jujitsu that turns a negative situation to a positive one or to work around them, we need to understand them. And really coming all the way back around to where I started, I think that the xenophobia is a core issue here, that the Maslow diagram doesn't just speak to the refugee situation, it speaks to the situation of most people, most governments, and perhaps society as a whole. And so we need to figure out how to address that, how to make it so that it's not a matter of mitigating threat, but rather a question of understanding a, a mutual self-interest. And perhaps one way in which that happens is by recognizing how the refugee problem is very much tied into the environment, both in terms of the climate refugee as a phenomenon, that is to say, with the oceans rising, and also in terms of how climate change makes for food insecurity, water insecurity, that we need to perhaps think about how both of these are addressed in tandem and in relation to each other in order to be able to have any sort of chance of being able to move the rich refugee problem out of that problem space of we need to avoid them or do away with them. Okay, so you were talking about climate change in the oceans. I think we're sort of transitioning. We're about 20 minutes in. I want to sort of go into uh, one of the ideas that you've been sort of really working on. Uh, I'll hand the mic over to you in, in, your, uh, in, in the, o the oceanic citizenship. I would not say that I have been really working on it in the sense that I've been in the ocean a few times, and <laughs> that is the extent of my experience thus far. But the general idea is to find a system already in place and think about how we might make use of it for means, for, for purposes that were not initially intended in order to most expediently bring about solutions to problems of identity and also of papers by which to be able to engage in commerce and to be able to move between borders. The idea is to make use of the international waters and to use the international waters as a basis for citizenship. That is to say that people can become citizens of the oceans or rather that everyone is by birthright already a citizen of the international waters and that either the United Nations working as an institution or countries that are willing to take this on at a sort of a, a beachhead to attempt not to pun but to do so in my effort to avoid it, but <laughs> that these nations can potentially provide a mechanism for citizenship 
by way of the oceans as a, as a territory we all share. And so this might work at the level of the UN effectively issuing documents to all or any who request them and proactively in places such as refugee camps doing so on the authority that is inherent in international waters as being outside of any given state authority and therefore having potentially authority of its own to do so, or if the UN is not willing or able to act immediately to have any given country can start an embassy of the oceans. Since the oceans are international waters, there's no reason why each and every country shouldn't have an embassy of the oceans. And if you have an embassy of the oceans, an embassy has a basis legally to potentially to issue papers. And so it can begin to do so. And if one country does, it's entirely possible, I think quite likely, that others will as well, simply not to be left out of the fact of having this oceanic connection. And as a result, you end up with a critical mass. And ideally, you are simultaneously enfranchising those who are without papers and also simultaneously giving this status to or recognizing the status for and giving papers to those who have already the privileges of a home state so that there can be a mutually reinforcing process by which people all feel like they're members of, this, of the same growing nation of the oceans rather than a stigmatizing that might take place if this is instead of having some sort of proper state citizenship. And this then becomes also a means by which there is a sort of connection to the oceans by way of this citizenship. The oceans are not no man's land, but become a homeland for all, which is to say that environmentally speaking, our sense that the oceans can be exploited gets transformed into a relationship with them that potentially mitigates some of the issues that I brought up earlier to do with climate change and how those exacerbate the problems faced by refugees and those who are stateless. Jonathan, if I could just ask you, I mean, I'm not really familiar with the concept, but how is that different from, from is it seasteading? Yes, so seasteading is a workaround that is used often by corporations, for instance, as a means by which to avoid taxation and to be able to operate otherwise without regulation. So it is a clever maneuver to get outside of state mechanisms for purposes of profit. And there's nothing wrong with profit, but it is fundamentally different from the problems that we're discussing here, which are problems of enfranchisement and identity. So just as seasteading makes use of a loophole in order to be able to make corporate interests operate in ways that they couldn't in any given state, here we're looking at the common interest and how to make use of a loophole effectively initially as a basis for then building the consortium that can lead to a genuine sense of oceans as a, as a place of belonging. Cheryl, you're a problem solver. Is this doable? Sure. <laughs> well, so I guess it begs a couple more sentences. So we're, I have a call that's supposed to start in about 20 minutes, which of course it won't. But in any case, in that call, we are going to be discussing uh, building a city-state on water. So I found it very interesting to meet Jonathan earlier today for the first time. Complete coincidence. Comple which is so amazing for me because Jonathan has very deep thoughts and very, uh, he spent a lot of time thinking about the implications. And for me, I'm more of a, hey, this is a good thing to do. Let's see if we can do it. And I immediately start, you know, jumping in and seeing what it would look like talking to people, and as soon as that happens, what often happens in my life is that I find other people around me who are doing some thinking about it. Um, in fact, three days ago, I received a design from a very dear friend of mine who was also thinking about building a city-state on the water. So I think it's a, one of those ideas that you know pops up in many different places at once, and everybody, to some degree, thinks, hey, this is my idea. And then suddenly it becomes our idea, 
which is lovely. Ideally, ownership of the idea is not really at stake here. I have absolutely no means by which to achieve this and put it out in the world as common property in the spirit of these conversations and in the spirit of finding those who have the means on the ground and experience and skill set to be able to achieve, if not this, then any of myriad other possible approaches to working around the problem in order then ultimately to confront it, not from a state of hostility or a state of that problem being totally outside the realm of possibility, but rather familiarity, that we're already there and we just need to acknowledge it. Acknowledge mm -hmm. it. Um, Amal, I want to turn to you for a second. Um, Jonathan and, and Cheryl were talking about a little bit more specific examples, but um, innovation doesn't happen overnight, does it? So I, I, I, I was wondering if you could actually just spend a little time talking about how important this philosophy is, embracing this philosophy as we move forward. I mean, it's um, definitely, it's an amazing idea. We've been hearing more and debating about it, you know, left and right, but having, throwing that idea out there is, is great for a lot of people to start thinking about. Well, innovation is about creating solutions, and that's a solution, right? Based on studies and based on understanding, you know, where people come from and what do they need. And as we said, you know, there's a lot about belonging, there's a lot about identities, there's a lot about access to services and just feeling like a human being. And I love that concept because it could be a start of a great thing. But we also think even when we're innovating, and that's what I would love probably to hear maybe in the session afterwards, until that becomes, you know, something that's being acknowledged and known to the world and these people can have access to. We always say that there are steps that might happen today that could make their life at least easier and it could be the prototype, you know, and the iterations that we can work on until we get to that. And probably earlier the argument is like, is it possible to have something that could acknowledge them virtually? That's why we said just like virtual ocean, it's still, it's a place where these people can be acknowledged and they could have a number or an identity or an acknowledgement by some form or shape. Since being virtual is the talk of today, we talk about technology, about digital world and about you know all of these stuff and including them in our life. We talk about the fourth industrial revolution, everything will be run you know, through IoT, artificial intelligence and all of that. So how can we, probably that's our role as well, how might we really support these entrepreneurs or these refugees you know, to have access to a normal life until this becomes an acknowledged you know, system? And here it comes, it's like the fact, can I look at what's existence today? Can I see if I can create that link, even if it's somewhere on the cloud until it goes into the ocean or until it goes into a land. And that's what we brought earlier. It's like when we said the example of Estonia giving the e-citizenship to the entrepreneurs, right? So they created a system, they started welcoming these people to operate and start and run their businesses. Great, lots of entrepreneurs are having a blast now, you know, by having access to such a thing. So probably the question is like, what can we do really today, you know, to unify all of that where it could transition to this big, you know, achievement. And I think that's, that's probably the question that comes to our head all the time. Is it about transitioning? Is it about identifying these people? Uh, we know how many are they, but do we know who are they? What are they good at? You know, what can they offer? Uh, where are they? What are the obstacles really that are they facing? I mean, looking now online or talking to a lot of organizations, we don't have a data that could actually tell us all the answers for that. So there's work to be done until we get into your ocean country. That's what I believe maybe part of, you know, our role is to get into. Now, who else? We talked about certain entities that could actually maybe engage, you know, in similar things. But um, definitely it's a question that comes to head, I mean, all the time and it could initiate also some actions, you know, over here. I think the part of the debate earlier, uh, you had to be there, was that there is great potential in what has happened in Estonia, but there's also within that the potential of effectively making a class of refugees who no longer are and leaving behind those who don't have the Capacity. skill set yes. that is valued by the system that is chosen. So it seems to me that we absolutely need to support that entrepreneurship and 
we need to do so from the standpoint of self-actualization, to use a word that makes me cringe, but nevertheless, <laughs> and we also need to do so from the standpoint of nation states valuing these people, but at the same time, we, we can't do that, I don't think, without simultaneously thinking about what sort of mechanisms can be put in place that are simultaneously providing the means for all to yep. have the basic rights that come with identity and with papers to be able to move freely. I think um, all these solutions are creating their own problems. Like, uh, of course. Yeah. And we don't want one more. For instance, let's say you have a headache, you come to me, like I'm like your doctor. So I say, how, how, I will I, how will I solve your headache? There are different means. But I should ask the question, why do you have the headache in the first place? For instance, and most of the reasons are not known. For instance, I just discovered those who cannot process the emotion of sadness have migraine. Okay? This is my observation. I think it's true. I think uh, we can do uh, experiments and we can prove it. Maybe it's in the literature. I don't know. I don't know the refugee literature. But why is there a refugee problem in the first place? So why are we not trying to solve the root cause? Why are we trying to solve the symptom? For instance, why are they living their own countries? And, and it's also like, why am I... You know, I think these are the questions we should answer. Like, um, then if you, uh, let me give you one example. You know, I work with parents, and parents tell me their children are jealous of each other, okay? So how will I solve this problem? They say, okay, you're gonna create another room, you're gonna separate them, you're gonna go shopping separately, and then, and then uh, those kind of solutions. And those solutions create their own problems, okay? So wh why are they jealous of each other? If there's a conditional love, if you're comparing your children, they want to get the most, of, uh, the, the most love from you. So you are the one who's creating the problem. So you should go back to yourself and you say, why am I giving them unconditional love? So th again, those who are accepting refugees and those who, like, who are sending them away. Like they are, like they are people, right? They, they think. So they should be asking those questions to themselves, and, and I think that's that. Um, I think that that's that is how we can solve this problem. But we all have a headache, and we can't think. So we need somehow to get the headspace, so to speak, in order to be able to do so in the first place. I think that there is a case of trauma, of uh, effectively dealing with an immediate and extraordinary problem, and then there is. Simultaneously, as you say, the matter of dealing with confronting the root causes. But I, I just don't know that we have the luxury right now to get only to the root causes as a means by which to address the clear and imminent problem. So first, if you have a heart attack, I can solve your problem in like one hour. But if you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to have a heart attack again in six months. So. Yes, the truth is hard You'll things. be dead already if you don't already address the first problem, as you've just said. Yeah, so yeah. You need to you need to first keep the person keep the patient alive, and yeah, we're not true. doing so right now. So let's think about short term. But we, if we don't think about the long term solution, we will keep having this short of term problem. Absolutely. So we should think uh, both ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Cheryl, let me turn to you. I know that you might actually have to... Uh, I'm not going to run. I'm going to sit. <laughs> I'm here. Okay. Um, listening to the discussion between Özgür and Jonathan, this question comes to mind. Is it easier to fix a system or to come up with a whole new system? So, I, what I like... Let's say repurpose. Okay. Repurpose the situation. Yeah. I, I, I like repurpose. You know, I'll tell you why I like that. I like repurpose because there's a sense of upcycling. You know, you take something that's, that we've already got and then use it in another way that serves our current need. So, you know, for instance, there are already ways that people are using portions of the ocean and setting out, okay, this is a space we're using. But they're not doing it in a way that really has a huge amount of integrity with what we want to accomplish as we're describing it. 
let's just say for the moment we want to accomplish it. We try that on just for the moment. Also, there are people who are ending up in groups. They're in, they're in tent cities or they're in, in warehouses and they're already kind of grouped together but they don't have a sense of belonging. So how can we repurpose those pre-existing conditions and make something that really works? So that's more how I'm thinking about it. Anyone else want to chip in on that? Jonathan, I, know. I, I think that there are many mechanisms of repurposing that become possible when you go down any given, get deep into any given system. So in the case of the oceans, for instance, it's interesting to look at the Nagoya Protocol, which is a means by which indigenous peoples get royalties on the use of materials that are found in their nation that are used in medicine, for instance. So bioprospecting benefits those of the country where a given organism was found. So you think about that, and you think about what might happen if we were to enact the Nagoya Protocol likewise in the oceans, which it is not currently, in a way that would provide for, first of all, the funding that would allow for all of those hundreds of millions of documents to be produced, but secondly, some forms of either, and I, I should say both welfare and also credit, a bank, you might think of, a bank of the ocean, in the same way that there's a world bank, in the same way that nations have banks. So suddenly, once you start thinking about oceanic citizenship and all people being citizens of the oceans, and you start thinking about the Nagoya Protocol as a means by which bioprospecting benefits indigenous populations in countries around the world, you put these together, and as Cheryl says, you upcycle, and you end up with something that is quite interesting. Whether it will work in terms of the international courts and all the rest, I do not know. But it seems to me that there are a lot of ways in which to work with the system in ways that work against how the system was built in terms of the intentions of many who built it for reasons that we now find questionable. Amal, how, how do you get um, startups and corporations on, on board to, to ideas that, that Jonathan and, and uh, Cheryl are talking about? You mean from the perspective of a startup in general, or how do they interact with this? I mean, looking, looking well, at... Actually, both, actually. Both. both. I mean, it's interesting. When we were first looking at this problem, we always tell the startup to do their customer discovery, right? And see who are the people they're going to serve and basically identify their needs and their pains, and then look into the stakeholders and the partners that you want to be with you that could support your journey, right? That's part of the customer discovery that you do at the beginning, which is part of your empathy journey at the very beginning. And I think, you know, since we're looking into all of this, we normally jump into our minimum viable product, right? Where we create something that will test the idea and then launch it to the market, right? So. When we were thinking of this, all I was thinking, whom do I need to engage? And I probably need to have multiple entities that I need to start testing the water you know, with them and see if there is any acceptance or at least welcoming or previous initiatives that they have worked on before that they could support this or they say, yes, I might be partially in, right? Now, my only problem is probably is such entities could take a very long time to act or take a decision, right? And that might delay the process. But I'm also with the fact where we can work both ways, you know, work on the real causes, but at the same time, I'm testing and I'm moving forward because these people are still stuck, right? As far as we're here, we're talking, but they still suffer and they still don't have access to education sometimes just because they don't have papers. And that actually happened, you know, I had an interview with one of the Syrians in Jordan and one of the things he said, you know, I can't have even access to education because my passport is in my country, it's in Syria, and I can't even renew it. I have to go back and get the actual document. So that takes me back is to the old systems and the old structures. So sometimes the government systems are willing to actually support or help, but they need what they know. 
right? They need to actually act with whatever they're familiar with. So how can we, as you know, someone like you, acting on such an innovative thing and innovative thinking, how do we really deal with the mindset that they have? And we know that this is the biggest obstacle in any innovation, it's changing people's mindset to accept what's new and what's different. You know, and that goes back to the emotional factor, fear. What's going to happen? Although if you look at facts and you look at the ground, you might see some of these solutions are out there in a way or another, right? It's just how do we really convey this message in a way where it fits the way they think? And I think if we figure that out, then you have, you know, a good chance of like understanding. And I don't know, I would love to throw it at you because mindsets and emotions really is a hot thing because I work on certain government, you know, problems, certain corporate, and it's the same thing. That big structure is so big and so old that it's so hard to push and move, unlike a startup. So maybe that's something that you probably, Oscar, I don't know if you can help us just look into that uh, emotional I factor. I feel like you don't need to push people. So what do we need to do? Hold uh, their hands? For instance, uh, like I'm an educator, right? So I give education example. There is a university entrance exam in Turkey. What does this test, exam test, is that's your memorization, like how well you memorize. Then what happens? The system self-organizes itself so that teachers teach memorization and they memorize. So I don't need to push people to, I don't need to push people to think critically or creatively. What I need to do is to change the exam. If I say from now on, I'm gonna ask questions that tests creativity, original thinking, and those kind of things. I will just change the system. I'm not gonna tell anything to people. You know what will happen? They will self-organize themselves. And then teachers, those teachers who teach really well are now bad teachers. Because if you teach well, it means students are listening, they are not thinking. And those who ask the right questions, those who make the children think, are good teachers. So just set up the system so that the end result and, and the system will self-organize self -organize itself. Mm. So uh, uh, we, ha we can bring uh, system thinking to mm. this. And then we, design thinking is a great way yep. uh, to solve both the root cause and, and short term. And then, and then I think um, then we have a better chance of solving not only refugee problem, but uh, other problems know. as well. There is this professor at Harvard, uh, Heifetz, Ronald Heifetz. He calls problems, technical problems, and adaptive problems. So we need to uh, we need to approach every problem both from technical and adaptive perspective. So, yeah. Um. I've been told by the organizers that we need to start wrapping up. I just want to turn to our audience, see if anybody has any questions or comments for our panelists. Uh, the organizer said, oh, yes. okay. Yes, this is what they said. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just stand up and speak. I'm sorry, what? They don't have numbers, they don't have uh, identification. Uh, can't we just keep the states here and just work with the companies instead? If the refugee needs uh, insurance, you work with the com insurance company. If they need uh, an education, you go with the private schools. Uh, the states here are in, in a world where the companies are getting stronger and stronger. Do we really need this interface, these uh, states as a middleman? So sideline the bureaucracy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I, I want to make a quick response, and then I see Jonathan has something. So I am very much for direct. I mean, all over the world, I know very much in California where I live, there are people who hire people who have no papers. This is, you know, let me just say it's not a particularly new idea, but turning it into a system and saying that those people can, actually lifting the ban, that is a new idea. So that's where the newness is. Because it is already that there are many companies and many individuals who are in a lot of, um, let's say, trouble for 
not, uh, not obeying the ban on hiring people who don't have documentation. And the same thing holds true for going to educational you know, systems. You can currently enter into university by testing in. You can. You can go without your documents, but it's not common. I was just going to say that I think that we come down again to the problems of stratification and of amplification of that by virtue of a company rightly and necessarily having the interests of the shareholder that are fundamental. And therefore, charity, unless it is marketing, is not really inherent to that corporation. And therefore, there is going to be a selection process in terms of those who are enfranchised or given numbers by that system, and there are many others who will not. It's only going to be if we are collectively willing and able to come around to some sort of a system that we all are a part of that we get at the root problem as opposed to simply lifting people selectively out of it and making life all that much worse for those who remain in it. Okay. Um, I do have to say that, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Uh, Amal, uh, Özgür, uh, Jonathan, and Cheryl, thank you very much. It's been really insightful for me because um, two weeks ago, I knew nothing about the subject. I know a little bit more thanks to you guys. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. It was really good working with you. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to present honor gifts for you. Oh. <laughs> and I would like to invite Mr. Mustafa Osman Turan, <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Director General for Multilateral. Citizen numbers. <laughs> this is honor gifts for you. 